picture it. Italy, 1999. The reek of antiseptic floor cleanser saturated the hair of the hospital emergency room. I was told to wait by the entrance in a small room dimly lit. The windows were open and I could cle clearly listen to the continuous buzzing of unbothered mosquitoes exploring the room. My clothes felt sticky with the sweat of that night and my legs were uncomfortable touching the plastic seating. I took my knees up and hugged them. I waited. The ride to the hospital seemed to last forever. The paramedics asked questions about allergies, medications, and the use of drugs and alcohol. I was afraid to be in trouble. I could not stop holding Alessio's hand. A few minutes before, his body was laying on the dirty concrete, his face next to grass and cigarette butts. The tears on my cheeks were warm. Alessio's hands were cold. Finally, my two friends arrived at the hospital too. Following behind them was a police officer. He had a black leather notepad in his hands, like in the movies. His eyes were judging us already, making us guilty of hurting Alessio. The smell, ugh, the smell, it was pulsing up from my stomach and slowly ascending my throat, now lamenting with nausea. The police officer stood in front of the door. I have to vomit, I bluntly said to him. I left the waiting room and to find the restroom. What the hell happened? Is my friend Alessio still alive? I coughed and spat in the sink, trying to wash off the red stains of my hands, only to realize it was Alessio's blood. Dry blood covered my cheeks, necks, neck, t-shirt and hands. The tears were coming back. I struggled to breathe and my legs stiffened. Not again, not again, breathe. Tired and bloody, a young man was staring at me in the mirror. I was 17. It wasn't a good year. I was 17 in that soft summer night, hiding from the lights. The police officer was gone. Alessio's friend, Nicola, was sitting in a corner of the room. His sunken eyes and pale face, illuminated by the fluorescent lights, remind me of the Munch painting, the scream. Thomas, Thomas on the other side, tapped his left foot on the floor. He looked at me and stopped. He took a deep breath and straightened his back. He moved, made his muscular chest pop. He did that every time he looked at me that day. Does it mean he likes me? Across the room sat a couple, presumably from Eastern Europe, by the state of their dated, worn clothes and heavily sprayed blonde hair. Covering our silence was the music coming from an old-fashioned television set hanging from the ceiling. It was tuned to Italia Uno, an Italian channel, showing a rerun of the Festival Bar, a popular show of itinerant concerts in big cities in Italy. A young woman lip-synced her debut pop song next to her four dancers performing a robotic choreography. Despite the innocence in her voice, her lyrics were jarring. Give me a sign. Hit me, baby, one more time. <laughs> Tomas asked if I talk with a doctor. I looked down and shook my head. They don't tell us about him. I met Alessio a few months before that night. We had a coffee at a bar. We chose a place far enough from each other's houses so nobody that we knew would have the chance to recognize us. Gently, he put down the little cup and took one look at me. Darling, 
We are so similar. Nothing could ever happen between us. Yes, it was that dramatic. <laughs> Let's become friends and hate the world together. You know what? Uh, it was friendship at first sight. But definitely I was not looking to become just friends. So I was thirsty to meet someone who would like me, someone to look me in the eyes and fall in love and have hot, sweaty, and intense sex. I'm talking about sex. <laughs> I was in chat again and again. It seems that I could not make it further in the conversation after I sent the first picture of my face. <sighs> but then it happened. And now I want every one of you to close your eyes until I say to open it. I met online Tomas, a bulky Italian Spanish student of Oriental languages at the University of Cafuscari. The first picture of him was downloaded in just three minutes. It seems a scene from a fashion magazine, a young muscular man standing on a beach as other young men played volleyball in the background. He was wearing a white tank top that showed his toned arms and broad chest. He also had a thick um, pair of legs of a soccer player and his feet were sturdy planted on the golden sand. It was a dream. Okay, experiment and close, open it. <laughs> that was the same summer when another young man, like me, curious about his new gay life, was brutally beaten by a gang of poor straight adults who deceived him in shot, met him uh, at his place and raped him. That happened in Padova the same city where Festival Bar was taking place. That night, to meet Tomas, I brought Alessio, and Alessio brought his friend Nicola. We headed to Yeslo, a small city on the coast near Venice. We parked uh, along the road, not far from a club. As we walked, we laughed and yelled at each other over the loud music from passing cars. Alessio carried a bag with a purple wig and his mother high heels for his drag queen persona, Donna Malapena, that in English translate as barely woman. He was set to perform later that evening. As we arrived at the parking lot in front of the club, Alessio put on the pair of heels and hollered at us. Hey girls, how do I look? I was looking afar noticing a white Fiat Panda that was circling back towards the park, the parking. Inside, a group of men with loud techno music. Then suddenly the car stopped a few meter, meters from us. One of them throws something in our direction and they yell, Andate a casa, froci. Go back home, faggots. Then everything went, fasting, went fast and confusing. There was Alessio bleeding on the ground, uh, Tomas trying to call for an ambulance, and people looking at us from the cars without stopping or even helping. I tried to clean his face with my shirt. He did not respond to me. Then the ambulance arrived quickly, and I left with him holding his hand. One of his teal heels with red flowers on the tip was stranded on the side of the street. They don't tell us about him. I heard the policeman's voice in the hallway. He was laughing with a nurse and they were standing close to each other. Frocetto, torna in stanza, go back in the room. He was mocking at me. I felt my heart racing my hand palms becoming two white fists. And then, Tomas wrapped his arms around me. His strong chest pressured against my head, his heartbeat regular, his breathing soothing. I finally closed my eyes. Am I safe? Then our heads moved together. I look at him, 
and he looked at me. I tasted the minty flavor of cigarettes smoked fast in the middle of the night. My first kiss to a man. Oh, ma che cazzo fate? E basta! You're both men! Act like it! Go! Go sit down! The police officer was back in the room and his voice, carrying a thick accent from South Italy, was echoing around us. So, let me understand, he started questioning. <coughs> because all of this is quite disturbing. Why is your friend here? What happened? I know you told me about a car with some guys who were yelling at you. What have you done to make them angry? Were you kissing? Were you having sex in the street? You know that I can take you down to the station for stuff like that. He did not give us the chance to talk, to say our truth. He was there to remind us he was a real man, not like us. He was there, this paragon of justice and protection to make us feel small, insecure, vulnerable, second-class citizens. Don't put your parents to any humiliation more than, you know, having you. Just leave. We were sent home, the four of us, without any sign of a report. We drove with the AC in the car shot to the max and a scratched CD of punk rock songs to cover our silence. Alessio rested his head on my lap. I caressed his hair, his hair being careful to not touch the bandages on his lower head. Tomas squeezed his hand a piece of paper that was from the policeman notepad throw in the trash. It was not a report. It was just one scrambled word. Froci. That's what we are. <coughs> After that night, I only met Alessio three other times, pale and quiet. I never heard his laugh again. He fell into the great flatness of depression. My last year of high school was spent between books and solitary coffees. I deleted all my virtual accounts, trying to, with all my strength, to just be invisible. <coughs> the death of Alessio by suicide. One summer after the events in the parking lot, arrived to me as an article in the local newspaper. It was the day after my high school graduation. The article reporting the loss of a normal kid, devoted student with an appeal for the art, did not shock me or make me grieve my friend as much as people believe it should. Grief comes in many shapes and there was not right or wrong in my feelings for him. I thought it was final free to be whomever he wanted to be, at least him. I was not even sure to be anything. My emotions were tied up in dealing with my own darkness. With time, Alessio became just one of the many young people, young queer people lost in those years. They say they were too fragile, delicate, sensitive. They were misunderstood and forced in categories. I did not get lucky to be alive. I thought about it, about ending. I even stopped myself on the tracks of the Carpenedo train station. I waited for the regional at 4.05 p.m. It was delayed and I left. I was just persistent to leave despite what was happening to me and around me. And yet, I wish I held your hand once again, dear Alessio, and told you that we are going to be fine. After all, we are survivors. <laughs> <laughs>